Welcome back to Obsessed with Death. Thank you so much for continuing to listen and support the podcast. There are many different ways you could support the podcast by listening, by sharing an episode, telling a friend, please. All of that stuff helps a ton. Uh, you know, posting the most recent episode that you listen to on social media is great. And uh, like I said, maybe just mentioning it to a pal that you think would like the podcast. All of that stuff helps a ton. Today, I am joined by journalist, author, and speaker Alex Strauss. She is celebrating the 20th anniversary of the cult classic novel, The Joy of Funerals. If you are unfamiliar with Alex's work, I definitely recommend checking out The Joy of Funerals. Make sure you pick up the reissued version that came out in October and check out some of her other work as well. You can go to alexstrauss.com for more info. Uh, really, really fun episode. Had a ton of fun chatting with Alex today. I think you're going to really enjoy it. So let's get into another episode of Obsessed with Death. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I sort of explained uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do, but I would love if you wouldn't mind just sort of introducing yourself and letting everybody know, you know, who you are and what you do. Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. I so appreciate it. And it's great to find a, a fellow death fan, if I can actually put those two words together without us both sounding gruesome and, and crazy. So I cover trends in pop culture, uh, predominantly for the Times as a contributor. And I write books with unusual titles. The Joy of Funerals was definitely ahead of its time. Uh, I'm, I've become very good at finding white space and then surprisingly being able to fill it. So I had this crazy novel, um, The Joy of Funerals, which was absolutely 20 years ago ahead of its time. And that was followed by a nonfiction book on suicide, the most unusual, interesting, fascinating literary suicides of our time, the 20 most influential from a pop culture point of view, which had not been done before. And, and here we are now in a moment where, unfortunately, suicide is at an all time high. So I am, and I had a white lotus before there was a white lotus in a, in another novel uh, called Based Upon Availability that all took place at the Four Seasons Hotel. So sometimes that can work for you or it can work against you. And I think part of what's been so fascinating in this additional tour of the joy of funerals is we are in this death curious moment now. And I that definitely could not have been said 20, 21 years ago when we were still whispering the word cancer. But now there's the death curious culture and the Gen Xers like myself are getting a little bit older and our parents are getting older as well. And there are, you know, mortician parties and people making their own caskets and things where, you know, you could the the grave talkers who are cooking meals with with people in in, in the ground. So I, I feel the world's caught up to me a little bit. Yeah, that must, there must be some, some feelings of validation in that I would imagine. And I'm so curious to discuss um, sort of what you mentioned here, where you were just way ahead of this like death boom that we're sort of having now. And I'm, I'm very curious. I, I want to get into that and discuss that more, but uh, we start episode every episode off with the same question, and I would love to to ask you as well. Obviously, this is the type of work that you're doing, um, but I'm curious what your relationship with death is like today. Uh, do you think about it a lot? Is it something that worries you? Is it is it is it something that just because of your work, your your it's a daily thought? Uh, what is your relationship with death like? As a single person, I wish death was, you know, coming over for cocktails. Um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, 
they would be like, hey, company. It's it, at, at 55, uh, it's much closer to me than I have ever thought about it before. And as I continue what I, uh, this this wonderful, crazy little book tour for the joy of funerals, and having done this deeper dig into death and our fascination with death and this death culture. And as my mother gets a little bit older as well, it has shifted. I I thought maybe I was prepared for it. Maybe not so much. Um, So like I know where our family plot is, but I hadn't really thought about what that would look like. And, and, you know, I thought I knew what outfit I wanted to be buried in just because I am a little bit, uh, I like to plan. I am everybody's three in the morning phone call and I have a to-go bag already packed and a to-stay bag now. Um, But I think, you know, those are just specifics and I do have a will, but have I really sat down and thought about who's getting what and where is it going to go to? And, it, and, you know, am I really ready for this next chapter of that great unknown? I'm a hundred percent not. So, but being in New York, you know, you feel you're on almost, you're, you're bipolar all the time because so much is happening in New York. It definitely has changed. And I, it's a fascinating, wonderful question to ask because I know it's, it's changing and it's, it's changing as we're speaking. I, I've really started to look at my relationship with death much more closely this year than probably ever before. So I don't know if it's just a that perfect storm of mortality of the book being reignited or resurrected, if you will, and my mother getting older and the way the world is and how dark the world is at the moment. Uh, but it is something that I do think about. So, but I'm also Jewish. So I would think that you know, I'm, we're thinking about it all the time. So I, I don't, and I'm neurotic from the Upper East Side. So, you know, I'm prone. <laughs> now you want to know why I'm inviting, you know, the Grim Reaper over. So sure. if you were single, you know, especially if you were single and good looking, that would be great. <laughs> I love, I love the question because I- I'm coming up on 60 episodes of this podcast now and every answer is so different. And it's so fascinating just to sort of get everybody's perspective on even just how they view the question. Like, there, I feel like there's so many different ways of even just responding to the idea of what is your relationship with death like. And a lot of people, I think, don't necessarily have one. Maybe more so the people that are listening to this podcast or that are reading your books, they may have more of a relationship with death in the sense that they do think about it more than the average person. But I I mean, I just, I don't think, not that I'm necessarily looking for like a, there's no right or wrong answer to this, but I just, I love, I I love asking people that question. I wish I could ask everybody. Most people don't want me to ask them that question, you know? And it's part of why we're here now doing this is because I'm just constantly looking for people Tell me what you think about death. Like, I want to know. It makes me feel better. You know, that's so interesting. If you don't like candy, don't go trick-or-treating. I mean, <laughs> I, I can't imagine being on this podcast and not being willing to, th- or thinking about, huh, I, I wonder if he's going to ask the question he always asks. And I wonder yeah. what, I mean, I hadn't thought about it until, you, you know, uh, in in this way per se but i i do i i i have been thinking about it so i wasn't thrown off but it is if people don't want to talk about death then they absolutely should not be they should not be doing this with you you know that sort of brings me to what we discussed just a little bit earlier here you know you were you were writing about death you were having these thoughts and these discussions and sort of putting yourself in this world uh you know 20 plus years ago when People were uncomfortable discussing illnesses and, and you know, specifically cancer. And I, I'm just so curious as to what that was like. Did, what, did it feel lonely? Were, were you almost inspired by the fact that you were sort of touching on this subject that m- most people were afraid to touch on? And then obviously the response I, I just asked you like nine questions, but uh, what what was that like? Uh, you know, w- working in this space uh, when most were were uncomfortable with it. Yeah, it, it's definitely lonely, um, and it's it's hard being 
early to market. I didn't think it would be this hard. And I, I didn't even think I was early to market when I wrote it. I thought I had something that no one else had in the way in which I had it. And I, I didn't think, I hadn't seen anything written about funerals and death. And it's, and I think people instantly think morbid and it's not. And I think that's what's changed the most maybe in these 20 years. So Originally, The Joy of Funerals, a novel in stories, was was written because I had a piece in the New York Times published on why I like funerals, a, an essay about being an only child, actually the only, only child ever in my family. So as far back as you can trace, everybody has had more than one child except my parents who could have had many and chose to just have me. But in doing that, they they also were were terrible at at creating a family or introducing me to relatives and cousins and all sorts of people that I was connected to and so we also were not really invited to the weddings and the the happier occasions or maybe my parents were and they left me home so i had no foundation and so i i i learned to like funerals because everybody's invited and everyone deserves a chance to say goodbye and so to me at 13 they were like, holy shit, this is a reunion. Like, this is awesome. There's food. And yeah, there's one less family member, but it's like great aunt Edna and she's 104. And, but this is your cousin and this is your aunt and here's your uncle. And this one's a little weird and had some face work, but they're a lot of fun. And, and it was just, it was, it was wonderful. And those became my reunions. And then I also love the idea of community and intimacy. And I'm fascinated fascinated by human behavior and intensity. And I, I think all of that converges at a funeral. And so I was working in the fiction space and I realized that in all of my short stories, somebody was dying. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I thought, well, what if I had a character that went to all the funerals you've just read about? And the reason she goes to funerals is because she's so lonely. And so I thought, well, that's clever and that's interesting. And so that's what I did. And and that was also, so I was up against a few, I was up against a few things. We had great, great um, reviews. We were very fortunate. We were compared to six feet under meat sex in the city. But at the time, that's all there was. And so we had a weird title that people were slightly offended by. I mean, we did not do well at the old age homes. So reading from the, the joy of funerals, you know, I think we also had a very different way to, to tell a story. It was not a typical beginning, middle and an end. But streaming now, 20 years later, has helped tremendously in sharing flashbacks and and flash forwards and different devices. And you can have different characters tell stories and there doesn't need to be this very staccato way of of telling a uh, a story. And then I had this subject that people saw as dark, but we love to confuse dark as something unattractive or not interesting to talk about, or we shouldn't talk about it, or it's taboo. And that's not really the truth. The truth is something that is dark means it could just be very deep. It could be very intimate. It could be very raw and exposed and vulnerable and interesting. And so here we are 20 years later, we've come off of a of a pandemic and we're in a loneliness epidemic and it, all these worlds converged at once. And this was the longest answer and I it became a soliloquy and I'm so sorry for that. And to all the listeners, I swear now, shut up. No, please. You're the perfect guest because I, I'm never going to feel like I need to pull an answer out of you. I haven't had a lot of them, but there are a couple of people that have come on here where it's like it was like pulling teeth where I was like, I thought this is a podcast. Please never apologize for the long response. I love it. I, I If you see me like sort of my eyes darting, it's because I'm constantly making notes because there's a million things I want to say from your response. Uh, you mentioned community. And I love that so much, right? Because the idea that you were going to a funeral and you immediately felt like a sense of community. Ah, that make that I I love that so much. I don't think I don't know if most people are going to go to a funeral and immediately feel like the, I I I've seen it, but it's so rare. 
I think that feeling of community at a funeral is so rare and it's so relatable because I'm, I feel like I'm constantly searching for community as well. Just my, myself personally, it's, Me too. it's something that gets brought up in therapy weekly for me. It's, it's, I talk about it. I was so lucky when I was younger growing up to have like the most cliche, perfect, like group of friends where it was like, we were all inseparable. We did everything together. It was like, it was a cliche how, how close we all were and, and the way we got to grow up. And I feel like you lose that as you get older with people moving and starting families and, and all of that stuff, life just happens and that goes away. So it is harder for people to get together and for everybody to be in the same room. And funerals are one of those rare situations where it does sort of bring everybody together for an unfortunate circumstance, but it does create this sort of community, if only during the funeral itself. But I just, I just love the idea of, and it's sort of happening now, right? Like there is like this death community that's, that's happening a lot online and more in person all the time. I'm seeing like these death events, which are so cool. So it's like, yeah, there, there is this community sort of developing where somebody doesn't have to die for you to all get together. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious for you. What, what was it like? Where was that, that, that need of community community coming from? Do you, do you feel like there was anything you mentioned being an only child? I would imagine that could be a part of it, but is there something you could pinpoint that was sort of drawing this, this need for community? Yeah, I had, I had parents who were, are, they were just, um, they were very non-parental in, in putting together a structure or an environment in which there were, I didn't have family. I only had family for the briefest of moments at funerals. That's, but I and I, I that carried over and I, I know you think it's rare and it and it may be to I'm wondering if maybe I'm just the only one who has vocalized it in a way that's obtainable or that people can digest to say, oh, that's the word we're looking for, because it seems so not common sense, but. We are, even if we're strangers, we are all at this one event next to a wedding it's almost the only time you can say you are all there for the same exact reason, whether you knew this person through a variety of people, whether you knew them at work, whether you knew them privately through a, a family, but everyone, everyone is there for the same exact reason, which is to pay their respects, to celebrate a life, to to become part of something, you know, bigger than themselves. And that is this communal bonding, if you will. And so it, it only makes sense, even if I'm, even if I'm the stranger in the room, I'm, I'm not because I'm connected by this experience we are all sharing. Unless you're like the main character, Nina, who is there under false pretense because she goes to other people's funerals she doesn't know, which I've never done, FYI. But we're all there for the same reason. Whether we like each other or not, we are all there for the same reason. And in that, there's community. You, it's just the way, I mean, at least, you know, I know we're now a, 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 a generation or a society that says, for me. And then we ask everybody why they all feel we're in this narcissistic moment because we're constantly adding the word for me in it, which we never did before is if I, you know, I mean, I'm only speaking for me, but that's a whole other thing, but is maybe it's possible that, that other people are feeling this. We just didn't know what to call it for me. <laughs> in yeah. a narcissistic way. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, you know, you, you, you sort of mentioned it already, but we're, we're living in a world where we've never been more connected, but most people have never felt more alone before it that's not real connection so the connection that you're speaking to if it's texting an insta lie which is what i like to call it it's not a real connection it's yeah. not i i i really feel the brainwashing is real there yeah. it's not 
a real connection. It's, it's, nobody likes to pick up the phone anymore. The phone was like the next thing we had if you couldn't see each other. Yeah. I just, you know, even Zooming, it's just, it just feels pushed and fake and phony and it, it's isolated us. I, I just don't see how people don't see how this is. It's isolating us. We're not, we're so lonely. We're so, even if you're married and with children and have two dogs and nine cats and a gerbil and, and a small chicken, you could still be lonely. There are people who, something is happening for us all to feel disconnected. Yeah, It's not just, you know, I, it's not like I'm prophetic. It's, it's, something is happening. When I first reached out to you about coming on the podcast, you were like, hey, let's get on a phone call. I want to talk on the phone. And I love that. I, um, I immediately was so much more excited to do this interview and to have you on the podcast and, and to chat more because I felt way more of a connection talking on the phone than, yeah, just going through email or texting. I think there's a ton of value in that. I, I, tr I want to try and find the little, the little bit of like positives that come from it. And I think that there's, there's moments, but I do think in like 20 years, people are going to be like, I can't believe you had an Instagram. That's insane. I couldn't imagine being a child right now, being in high school with the internet. I would, I would lose my mind, but I am, I am glad it brought us together. So there's like little pieces, you know? So, you know, there is talk of the technology to bring us back to death in a full circle moment. Yeah. There is talk of technology going into the coffins and you'll be able to take photos and, uh, and you can see that dead person or the deceased person or whomever in, in, in like selfies almost with, with different backgrounds. And so I think that's the next thing coming. I don't think that's so, um, it, that's not so far, uh, into the future. And I don't think that's so crazy. And I, I guarantee you in the next few years, that's going to be an offering. Oh, um, yeah. So there's this writer director. His name's Ryan Newfer. I did an episode with him. He did a short film about a selfie casket. It's I'll send it to you. It's incredible. It's 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 he's an incredible writer, uh, director. And yeah, the entire movie is basically about this father who whose daughter is dying. And it, it covers like basically the dad being offered money to you know pr promote the selfie casket and he's looking at it as a way to stay connected with his daughter after she after she dies and it's an it's an incredible short film if if, if I'll, I'll yeah i'll send it to you he came on the podcast we had a great conversation um he was somebody else that you know i was just i me and him could have talked for about death for a very long time um you did you did mention just sort of in passing that you've never gone to somebody else's funeral, that, that this character you've created, she would go to other people's funerals. And I'm curious, are, are you against that idea? If people are like really looking for like any sort of like sense of community, um, what if they, what if they listen to this episode and decide I'm going to start, you know, quote unquote, crashing funerals. It kind that I don't see, is there anything, is there, is that bad? Is that wrong? I don't really, is there something wrong with doing that? I, I don't see the negatives to it. Well, what I, I think what was really interesting about the main character, Nina, in, in The Joy of Funerals, and, and what I did have to do was make her an incredibly reliable character. So even though she's super lonely and she goes to other people's funerals in order to connect with the mourners and to feel more connected herself because she can't connect to the people in her real world, I like very much that she hadn't done anything terrible. Like she didn't kill anybody. She wasn't wanted by the law. She wasn't selling, you know, blocaine and in, in the back of a Ford Chevy or something. It is, is she, you know, doing the nicest thing and lying to people and sort of pretending to know. So that's what she does. You know, she goes to these funerals and there's a, a heart specialist who has died. And uh, she's like, he's the first one to detect the murmur. So she's brilliant at slipping in and out and becoming these, you know, um, she's a chameleon of sorts, a, yeah. a, a funeraling chameleon. Yeah. But it's a different kind of not real. And I think if you're starting any relationship off with a lie, that's bad. That's a bad idea. That does not gel well. I, I do think if, if 
going to somebody else's funeral that you don't know, you might, then you should go and buy a ticket to a theater because then, you know, that's, it's not an installation. You're not, you know, you're not walking <laughs> yeah. around um, at the MoMA and, and, you know, Dash No also God rest his soul has not come back from the dead and created, you know, a bunch of corpses and we're just all moving through his world. I, I, I think part of it is, is the privacy in one sense of those who it's that's that beautiful juxtaposition. You know, we're all, some of us are strangers, but we're allowed in because we did know that person as opposed to the person who is just, I, I think go to the library or Barnes and Nobles or another location. I think pretending, you know, the deceased um, in a non Meisner activity is probably the way there's such less connection happening at the Barnes and Noble. The emotion that you're going to get from this funeral is, is not comparable to going to an art exhibit where everybody's there probably with their significant other or friends. And then you're just there observing other people enjoying themselves. Why not bring a little extra light to the family and, and have them see one more person there to, to celebrate the life of this person they love. And then you also get a little bit of connection on top of that. I mean, I think if you're there to, to, for the regular and the, you know, and the babka afterwards, because some of them, you know, there are several days of sitting Shiva or right. of to um, a, a different kind of, of wake or what have you, all of which they're extremely bonding um, I, I don't, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to be responsible <laughs> for it. Go live your life and be well. Should you sure. choose to feel invigorated after hearing this podcast, run to light, Carol Ann. I, I don't, I don't know. I it's absolutely not endorsing anything. No, of course not. I just think that it, it's, it's an interesting way to seek connection and yeah. uh, emotion from, from strangers, I guess is really what you're you're getting from it because I mean if you think about it too is it's like I, I I had gone to some funerals when I was much younger for great grandparents and I mean I didn't know them I, I was as much of a stranger as somebody who could have just been walking in off the street but I don't know funerals are tough um you're included you know what in your genetic makeup that's you yeah to right seat at that table I and am, I think yeah. that's that's what was so mesmerizing to me as a child. Uh, yeah. You know, not only was it a, it was a solemn event um, and I was, and it happened to have been for my grandmother. So it was somebody I was enormously close to, but when you're 13 and I remember holding court, I mean, I remember everyone being super nice to me. I, I really do remember being led around a room and, and because she was the favored of her family and she had all these additional siblings. She was one of five. So everybody sort of did come and to be introduced to this is your cousin. You know, I knew what a cousin was and I knew what an aunt and uncle were, but to really be able to see all these people in a room and to have a temporary sense of belonging for an only child who never got it at all you know, that was my cocaine. Like that was, you know, <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, I was high on, you know, a family tree that was not, was not a big bloom for me. You know, I don't, we've not, I've never been invited to a re I'm 55 now and there's no reunion. No one has ever invited me to a family reunion. And that's not to say I do have cousins. Hope they're listening. I do have cousins and you know, their whole lives have happened. I, I don't think they're, I don't even think they're interested in extending that open door policy or to, and I, and I've met them now on my own as an adult, you know, you learn to, you reach out and, and I've tried that. And I, some of them also, they're not, I mean, they're, it's been a struggle. It's, and then, you know, then you learn to make your own friends. I feel like we need to do some sort of, um, commercial now for an antidepressant or something but next thing you know i'll have somebody from one of the big pharma calling me being like boy do we have a great 
sell your book and we'll sell some, you know, prescriptions and they'll be, so I just think that, um, and then obviously you find friends to become your family. I, I do think though, it does go back to, there are a lot of us who I do feel are disconnected and not having, having a real authentic, emotional, intimate relationship is I think, especially now circling back to the social medias and the internet is harder and harder and harder to do. I think if you look at those Zoom funerals we had, you know, at a necessity, as opposed to an in-person funeral, you can even see how, how distancing that was. Yeah. It, I, I, they were totally, they were so different. I, you know, at the end, you're watching a movie. I was watching a movie of a friend of mine. One, it felt terrible to know I had had a friend who had a heart attack and died at 57, which was insurmountable and horrible. And it happened, you know, they the funeral was in Florida and I, we couldn't go to it. And I'm watching it on TV. So it, it kind of it looks like a home movie, but it's not a home movie. And I know these people, but I'm not there. And it's something else that I'm missing. And it just, it wasn't the same. It felt awful. I was never into any of that stuff i had to do a zoom wedding and even that was just like this is such a bummer it was my sister it was just like you, you, you it was very unfortunate um we made the most of it you know we tried to have some fun there was i don't know a hundred people on the zoom it was chaos but still you at least get to see you know you, you get to see the bride and the groom whatever you try and appreciate it but yeah i don't wish that on anybody and funerals, I think, are on the, that same page. I was, um, you know, lucky enough in the sense that there wasn't really any death for me directly that would, you know, involve a, a, a Zoom funeral. But, yeah, I mean, I saw it happening all the time. And, you know, again, just zero, like, real connection coming from that stuff. Um, just going back to, again, you, you sort of were creating this this death world uh, through your work and and. It, there weren't a lot of people talking about it and it did make everybody so uncomfortable. Was there anybody that you sort of, w that you could connect with on this? Was there, you know, where did you go? W was there anybody in your life around that time that you could talk to death about that, that would sort of help guide you? Or was this something that you were just completely doing on your own? I really was doing it on my own. Uh, I have very, I also have very, um, you know, I, my, my parents were not, they weren't avant-garde people or, or very artistic people or anything like that either. And I, I don't think they understood, not that it was so complex, but how deep and different it was. Uh, but I, I will say as an out of the box thinker, I wanted to have my party. I've always also understood PR and marketing really, really well. And I, I've, and I know how to produce so it, I'm that weird kind of person where I'm extremely creative and artistic, but I really understand business. And so I had gone, we were, we, I grew up on the Upper East Side. We were not far away from Campbell's funeral home, you know, the signature funeral home, if not just New York and in, in the United States where everybody watched Succession, that happened there, Judy Garland's funeral and a, a slew of other luminaries. It was a, it's a New York signature stop. My father's funeral was there. My grandmother's funeral was there. Uh, both my grandmother's funerals were there. We're, we're a repeat offender. And I marched myself into the funeral home, you know, 21 years ago. And Kevin Mack was the, uh, the director at the time. And he was so amazingly thoughtful. And I, I, I shoved, you know, as thoughtfully as possible, the book in front of him. I'm like, I'm, you know, please, I know you've never done a book party at the funeral home. Please, please, this is such a community oriented. And I explained the reason, you know, once you explain to people opening up with, you know, I love funerals is, is, can be jarring. I mean, you know, it's not a, a cocoon. You're not cocooning somebody in, but once you explain where it comes from, it's not like I'm a sociopath and I'm stealing all the, the trinkets out of the coffins. You know, I'm really there to appreciate the life I'm there to celebrate. It will be very respectful. He got it immediately and they were so generous. They've been my biggest champions and they, I'm my big prediction is funeral homes are going to be the new community centers. And then 
20 years later, when this, this novel was resurrected or, or had a second life, using every pun available, I marched myself back to, to Campbell's and the new funeral director was Bill Villanova, who is just as amazing and just as thoughtful, if not even more so in, in a, a even bigger thinker of what Campbell's is and what it stands for. And he got it immediately. And, and he said, not a problem. We'll, we'll do your book party as well. And so I'm a very big believer in matching theme with venue and, and really having an experience. And so both book parties, those were those two people, but they were in the funeral world. You know, they were in the, they really understood. And I don't think they look at it as death either. I think they look at it as community service. It is all of us, all of these stories, all of these people, the people in the world that you and I are speaking about, the death doulas, the, the gal who works at um, Gabby, who's at Greenwood Cemetery and does the programming there. Amazing person, really fascinated by all these different components and the classes and the grief groups and the you know, knitting and talking about mortality classes. And it it is a movement. You do have these people who are really interested in creating community around the most universal experience for all of us. And I say this in a lot of my talks because I I write about I write about weddings. I, I, a lot of my focus is on weddings, which is a different kind in some sense. It's a, it's a happier funeral, so to speak. It's the beginning of a life together with someone else. Funeral is obviously the end of more of a solo life, but the eulogy and the vows, very similar because you're learning things as a, as a listener about a person you may not have had all those pieces to. And it's, and it's all bets are off any emotion. It's the highest of emotions. You know, people will, will, they may not find great love, but they're always going to experience great loss. As humans, we're always going to experience great loss. We're all going to have to die. We unfortunately are all going to, unless the people in the cryogenics or something else happens in a vanilla sky kind of way. But, you know, I, I'm still looking for for love. But, you know, if 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 the great unknown or God is is good to me, I got another 40 years to me. So, but I'm, I, at some point I'm going to die. We're all going to die. We may not all find great love. I hope we all find great love. I would love, you know, not to die so soon or anything, but another long-winded answer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please never apologize. I love that. I, it's it's great that you that you had these people that you could reach out to them that were so understanding. Uh, obviously, you 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 went to the right place. I think for you know the the that connection and for those. Uh, for for the type of feedback and you know I think especially in a time where you were doing this I'm sure it was very difficult to to find people and for you to be able to get like such you know great people to champion you uh, I'm sure that was that was a tremendous help. Like we invited people to a, a a a welcoming funeral in some sense. We said funeral attire you know requested. We had a harp player. We had funerals. I had a goodie bag put together. From the minute you get that phone call that you know is that awful phone call to the minute you get home where you're like, I just need a drink, you know, and you've seen people you didn't want to see. Maybe you didn't have any work done on your face. Maybe you didn't go to the hair salon beforehand. Maybe you barely held it together. Maybe who knows? But there was like there was a shot of coffee from Illy, who is a, a big contributor. We had um, a vodka company, you know, don't, I mean, like I was really into, we had tissues and sunglasses and lipstick and waterproof mascara, like anything and everything that you could need to get through, you know, a, a funeral. And, you know, we were, we were, it was a very successful party, I think, because people were willing to, to go, I think, um, when we did it the second time, you know, we really upped the stakes and, and people were abs people absolutely understood what we were trying to do. So it, it still feels, look, you know what? It still feels lonely. I, I think I'm not a chick lit writer. I'm, I'm never going to be a, a chick lit writer. I mean, I, I could do it if somebody said, you know, here's a million dollars. We'd like you to write a chick lit novel, sure. but it's, 
not it's not what comes it's not where my passion not not there's anything wrong with chiclet i mean it sells tremendously and um people retire on that i expect a lot from my readers i i i want them to have a buffet not in in like a like a bulimic buffet afterwards but i want them i want them to have everything i want them to have every taste every texture um every type of food that they want um, I am not about the amuse bouche. I, I I really don't think, and I'm 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 not about just a, offering someone a salad. I want them to, to. I mean, I don't think you should eat the shrimp if it looks like it's a bad color. I want them to work their way through a menu. I'm I I don't, and I think they deserve that. I think any reader who picks up a book deserves that. It's it's interesting now that the world is ready for that kind of meal. You know, yeah. not the authentic people probably, but you know the. <laughs> The, the rest of the world who still enjoys food. I've never written a book, so I can't fully relate. But I know that when I create these episodes and when we have these conversations, you know, I definitely don't want um, I'm never going to sit down with somebody and just like read through like a list of questions and just like get a response and then move on to the next one. I want there to be substance and I want there to be a, a genuine conversation. I want an experience. I want to be moved. I, um, I do not want a story about, uh, you know, uh, a mother and daughter get along well in the beginning and get along even better at the end. I, I want an experience. Uh, I, I really appreciate you, you know, taking some time, uh, to, to chat and, um, please it, tell people where to go or the, you know, what you, what you want, I, uh, you know, where, where you, people could find your work or, or whatever's going on, I'd love for you to share. Thank you. Um, so if you do want to purchase the Joy of Funerals, the 20th anniversary edition, please don't go and purchase an old copy. Um, that would be amazing. It is on any anywhere you can find a book uh, online. The independents are fantastic. Uh, the, the bigger companies also fantastic. It, please buy the book. Um, you can find me at alexstrauss.com on my website and you can follow me also at Alex Strauss on InstaLive. There you go. I couldn't say it with the, uh, and I'm on it's all right. Twitter, whatever Twitter's called now. It's all the, you know, it's all just, just buy me some chocolate covered pretzels with some sprinkles. I mean, I don't, I, you know, it's all, it's all the world is imploding. I it, it, I don't know what to say. Uh, you know what I I do. I love speaking engagements. If anybody's listening, and I love paid speaking engagements. Yes, yeah. so I would like I would like to be uh, infiltrated with offerings of um, paid speaking engagements. Clearly, I'm somewhat humorous. <laughs> I had a great time talking with you. I'm so glad you came on the podcast. I hope. Um, that you would uh, come back on again sometime. I feel like I have so much more that I want to talk to you about and, uh, you know, discuss some of your other projects. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll you'll have some exciting news about some other things in the future. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was really fun. Thank you for having me and for doing this. It's, it's really, um, it's so wanted. It's such a needed thing. So thank you. Of course. Yeah, thank you. 